Buongiorno everybody and welcome! Thank you for making the trek all the way to the end of the Convention Center to spend a few minutes here to learn about how to design an identity as a service friendly to developers. My name is Vittorio Bertocci and I work for mm, 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 Of Zero. <laughs> I work for Of Zero, where I pretend to be an architect. So far, they didn't catch me yet. It's, so don't rat me out. And I'm here to deliver you a sad message. The message is that, uh, my friends, we are cursed. We are cursed mostly because we know too much. Some of the faces here I have seen for the last decade at every single identity conference. And I'm watching exactly in that direction on purpose. <laughs> yes, you, my friend, you. And uh, all of us, or most of us, are identity practitioners, and we've been debating late at night with our drink on that specific flavor of off that should be used in that specific scenario. We help the customers with the oddest, strangest situations. And uh, we just cannot unlearn what we've learned. We know what we know, and now we are cursed because we cannot any longer inhabit the perspective of someone that doesn't know about identity. And the reality is that uh, the vast majority, well, a large, large number, I believe the vast majority of developers really don't care about identity. It's a bump between them and uh, the resource that they want to access, the data that they want to access, the algorithm that they want to start, the result that they want to retrieve. So that's people that uh, will remain for the large part, ignorant about identity. They just want to go through this bump. But now, again, as someone that has been in this space for a long time, I know what is the standard answer that I use to get from engineers, from other practitioners, and similar, which is, can't they read the effing specs? Is this recorded? <laughs> is there a problem with uh, hope that? Uh, I will not uh, suffer consequences because of this. But the message here that I often hear is, uh, come on, nowadays we just have JSON in, JSON out. These specs are simple. So if I create an authorization server, I take care of being uh, standard compliant, I take care to document this, I take care to provide SDKs that use this stuff. What's the problem? After all, it's not like it's the 90s. That thing is from 2005. It was two months since I got off a boat, uh, just, uh, like, uh, it was just joining Microsoft uh, Corporation. And in Italy, you cannot have a, like, a um, vanity plate, but here you can. So of course, I promptly got it. And WS Star, uh, most of you remember what it was. It was a very, very rich set uh, of protocols, which substantially uh, solved uh, lots and lots of problems, including things like uh, that we only now we are starting to think again, like uh, no repudiation and similar. And of course, now I no longer go around with a funny pack. And uh, I don't know if you see the vintage uh, Bluetooth headset, which was like high technology at the time. Also, I've learned how to curl my hair since then. At the time, it was uh, all straight. But uh, anyway, the point uh, that you hear from uh, the uh, apologists of OpenID Connect uh, of and similar is uh, those were the really complicated times, and now everything is easy. And my friends, if you develop your de developer-facing uh, solution, in this way, you are kind of in this situation in which uh, you are deluding yourself that uh, these will make things usable. Of course, uh, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating you don't follow standards. We must all follow standards. At this point, it's not even in question. It's like uh, the way in which you exist in our ecosystem is by using the standard. The point is, uh, the standard doesn't automatically make your system usable or understandable for developers. And uh, let me make these concrete for you. How many of you guys read this specification? So you are already very, very atypical. Like, uh, go on the street of beautiful European Boston and ask people, how many people read this thing? And, uh, 
you will not get this percentage. But of course, that's not the problem. The problem is this thing is 86 pages. This is not a Harry Potter prose. This is a <laughs> sentences like this. You know what's tragic? I know what's tragic, but some of you will read this and will say, what's the problem? <laughs> of course, that's like how you use the token endpoint. What's wrong with you? But the fact is that for the majority of developers, this is their reaction. It's like, what? What is this thing? Why do you say authorization so many times in a sentence? I don't understand. And also, you can see very like a cyclomatic complexity of that thing is high. You have links everywhere. So let's follow these links. Let's say that we did the effort of reading OpenID Connect spec. And now the next step is OAuth, of course, because we have built on top of OAuth. OAuth is also not an easy read. It's 56 pages, and it's not enough. Because when you use OAuth, you are using the better token specification, right? So you have to read that as well, which mercifully is only 18 pages. However, when you implement any of these, of course, you have to do this very securely because like, you don't want to get in the news for the wrong reason. And so what you have to do is to read 71 pages of a threat model, which again is something that you need to read with a large supply of caffeine or your stimulant of choice, I don't judge. Like, it's tough. And this is only going in one direction. If you go in the other direction, in which you say, okay, we introduced the good things in OpenID Connect, like the ID token, but in order to do the ID token, oh, never mind, I missed this one. Um, you have to uh, look at the way in which we extended the, uh, like the encoding in, uh, um, in OAuth. And the end result is that uh, you get down the rabbit hole of uh, JW something, JWT, JWS, JWK, JWA, all of these things are uh, like, I'm not saying that every developer has to read everything, but uh, the signal to noise ratio is a complicated thing to navigate, right? Like uh, you don't know what you need to know. And so you end up having to read more than necessary. Also, provided that you have a good mental stack in which you remember the thing that you just read, because uh, all this stuff is like, uh, has lots of uh, links uh, that are circular. And then, of course, if you wanted to consume this thing from the client, you need uh, to understand discovery, which, by the way, depends on you understanding the keys the, and all the various crypto of the, which I defined earlier. You need to do it if you use the dynamic client registration. You need that as well. And unless you are building a website for Hotel California, you also want to be able to sign out. And as a result, you have more pages, which at this point, like you have been beaten all the way. So. What is it? Seven, 13, eight, 29 pages. Pff, that's easy, right? So those are only the specifications which uh, I could get uh, edge directly from the core. I didn't touch on the experimental stuff, which is going on, like uh, the OpenID Connect Federation, like the token binding, like the proof of possession, like uh, even some stuff that was linked here, I decided to spare you. I didn't add uh, like the assertion. I have a number of assertion profiles. So I hope that the main point is asking normal, like humans, muggles, using the uh, Harry Potter metaphor again, to grok all of this thing is uh, misguided. And typical comeback from some of the engineers that here is, uh, why don't you just give them an SDK? And uh, it's a good question. Like uh, we do need, what's going on there? I see movement. Uh. <laughs> okay. No, I don't think it's you. It's like, uh, unless your legs are exceptionally long. Ah, oh, no, it's you. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Sorry. I got this slide. I said, uh, is it a threat? Or should I uh, get off a stage? Maybe I should, but for different reasons. But, but anyway, so before I get to the SDK here, no, I can't given that I tracked down the graphic I wanted to get the return of investment. So for the SDK part, it's a, an, often uh, something which is mentioned. As in, like, uh, take an SDK, the SDK will take care of a lot of this stuff. And that's true. Doing stuff without the SDK is uh, silly. And to say that there is so much of this that you just needed to do every single time. So why would you want this uh, Sisyphus uh, torture to do it uh, again? But the point is that uh, using an SDK which implements the protocol does not uh, save 
the developer from having to understand some of these concepts, at least. And these concepts typically are buried in that thing. There is no uh, easy way to consume it. And here, I'll give you a practical example, which in the last uh, five, 10 years, I met multiple times since we introduced the flash tokens. So here, classic scenario, someone needs to set up a demo for their bosses, you showing a native client. So they set the demo, they use the SDK, they get an access token. Yeah, fantastic. Shake hands, great, we buy it, and everyone leaves. And now the developer is left with this application, and after one hour, or whatever, this token expires. And luckily, there are provisions for refreshing this token, right? And so, developer tries to use the method for the refresh token, and it doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? Hit Stack Overflow and find out. Turns out that the developer had to pro provide a secret. So the developer provided a secret, and finally, they refresh this. And then their security person finds out and shaves the guy in public, saying, come on, you can't use a confidential client for modeling a native client. You have to use a public client so that you don't need to use a secret. And then at this point, this person <laughs> commits suicide or changes. Like, in general, this thing is just for telling you, even if you use an SDK, if this SDK provides you primitives at the protocol level, you are still going to be exposed to complexity, which is, of course, a problem. So, OK, Vittorio, you gave us the issue. So what are we going to do about it? And uh, it's easy to say, it's very difficult to do, but the main thing that you want to do is to listen to listen really well to what they say and what they don't say. And here you can have uh, multiple channels. Like uh, today, if there is no shortage of something, is data. You can spend the days on Stack Overflow. You can uh, go to conferences like these and overhear what they're saying. You can have like your marketing motion in which uh, you approach developers. Like, uh, if you want to find information, you can find it. And in fact, for some of the things that I'll suggest, uh, you have it to step up and do interviews, uh, do uh, usability studies, and similar. But here are some quotes which I gathered from some of our customers. Can you read, or is it too small? Too small. Yeah. So with my accent, I'll read for you. The first line is, I would like the use of zero to allow visitors, censored, to log in and sign up using Google and Facebook. Easy, clear. There is no indication of an uh, implicit grant uh, or uh, uh, nonces or state. That is. I'm looking to replace my bespoke SSO solution for customers across our website. This is what I want to do. It can be best described as flaky and unreliable. Our customers pay for access for content across multiple sites, often have to relog in when they are passed between sites. We are looking for an SSO solution that will provide the functionality. It's telling you what he wants. He's telling you what is the problem that is making the current solution ineffective. I'm putting a lot of quotes in here because I think that those are things that are, um, you really, like, it's important to look at this stuff with this aspect because the instinct for a lot of practitioners is looking at this and you hear hybrid flow. You hear implicit flow. You hear like uh, they have various grants instead. No, listen to what they want. And then once it's time to implement it, then uh, you'll decide the best way, of course. But uh, it, uh, it is not necessarily part of the solution that you provided to them. Uh, yeah. So here, uh, substantially, uh, I'm giving you a number of examples. I won't give you uh, all the details, but uh, these things uh, range from I want to sign in with a certain user to I want to deal with authorization with my APIs, to I have a collections of applications. In some cases, it's multiple apps for my customer. In some other cases, apps for my customer and for my internal users. And uh, um, from APIs for programmatically accessing the user, so beyond pure authentication, identity is not just authentication. And then finally, I added one last one to represent the fact that, uh, yes, for some developers, Operating at the protocol level is meaningful, is important. 
they might have constraints in their uh, scenario which do require specific things that need to happen at the protocol level. In this case, this gentleman has a specific grant that they want to use. You might have other cases in which they want to interoperate. And so there is a parameter as part of a problem statement that they need to match. So here I'm not saying never speak about protocols. I'm saying distinguish when protocol is an actionable affordance which the developer needs to be exposed to as opposed to a case in which uh, it's uh, um, just the implementation. So how do you actually take this stuff and change your system? How do you design, how do you incorporate in your design this uh, intelligence? How many of you ever heard of a jobs to be done theory or jobs theory? I'm looking at, uh, where is Chris? Ah, thank you. Okay. Our head of product has been part of uh, creating this theory. So at the very least, I was expecting him to. But of course, he is. The jobs to be done theory is uh, an, a theory that came up from uh, the same guy that uh, wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. How many of you guys read The Innovator's Dilemma? How many of you guys heard about The Innovation Dilemma? More or less the same. Well, that's a, a seminal book uh, in business in which uh, uh, this, uh, this guy basically studied well, um, innovation, the problem of innovation. But uh, in his uh, jobs to be done theory, he goes beyond. And uh, he substantially asked himself, why is that innovation is such a hit and miss? Sometimes it works and you disrupt one entire industry, but uh, very often it doesn't work. And why somewhat it seems that people are willing to accept this as a positive to try to find a way which is more reliable and uh, delivers uh, results more reliably. And so he studied the way in which innovation happens, uh, the way in which uh, people decide to adopt something, and came out with his theory. And this theory is like, uh, once you get it, it's like, oh, sure, duh, obvious. But we needed him to define it. And the idea is, uh, People bring services and products in their lives because they hire them to do some kind of job. Where job here has a very specific meaning, which I'll mention in a second. And for us, as service providers, the key to not only to successful innovation, but to do services that actually solve the problem that the customer has, is to identify those jobs. The, so identify the problems that the customer wants to solve, which are only tangentially related to the protocols that we are using to solve this. In particular, the official definition of this is that the job is the progress that an individual seeks to achieve in a given circumstance. So this is not a need. This is not like have to eat. This is something far more specific, as in like, uh, I am, uh, um, I'm stuck somewhere. I needed to go uh, someplace and it's raining. Well, how do I get to this other place without getting wet? Things to this effect. It's like, uh, it has to be very specific. It has to be, uh, it has to include the circumstance in which this thing is happening. Otherwise, it won't be actionable. Like, uh, think of uh, how many times you ate in your life in how many different uh, uh, ways and circumstances. There is no single way for solving this thing. Whereas, if you get more specific, if you define the circumstance, and if you define the function that you want, both contribute to define what the job is. Also, how many of you guys ever did uh, usability studies using personas? All right, some. <laughs> of course, Mike. Mike from our team is a big fan of personas. And personas uh, are a useful tool for modeling this thing, but they're not the same as jobs to be done. Like when you do studies and you find, uh, you discover, it's a discovery process, you don't invent them, you literally mine for them. Um, and you find out, uh, you identify a job, you'll very often find that it is cross-cutting. It is interesting, multiple different personas and categories. And now sometimes you can do the two things same time, but it's important to keep them separate because uh, they don't lead to the same result. The other thing that uh, um, it's tempting, it's tempting because engineers like it a lot, 
is uh, to think of that once you've found a solution, like a shape for an artifact, this thing will work uh, for everyone. Or to try to find something which will work for everyone. It turns out that uh, very often, people use the same artifact for uh, multiple different jobs. And uh, if you don't take this into account, you'll end up doing a terrible, a, a terrible job of implementing all these jobs. Sorry for the pun and non intended. So the idea that uh, you can have uh, one set of features and it will work for everyone normally doesn't uh, lead to uh, good results. And I have some examples that uh, I'll show you in this effect. So here there is uh, some high-level indication on how you can search for jobs. One is, of course, like trying to understand what they are trying to do. And so in our world, this uh, includes uh, things like uh, all the usual suspects, as in uh, we have developers, we have websites, we have users, like uh, there are a number of flows in which uh, all of these things uh, will come together in canonical ways. And so the trick here is uh, to uh, list those and decide the ones on which you want to focus, or listen to what your customer is saying or what uh, they are doing, even if they are not using directly your product, and extract this information. The other part of which is really important is uh, the circumstances. Like uh, a developer which is trying to set up a demo because tomorrow they have uh, their meeting with the venture capitalists. The venture capitalists will decide to give them money or not. So they are in an existential threat mode will react differently from the one that is doing uh, software selection and is on a five years program for uh, digital transformation and similar. So the circumstances will dictate how you project your features and how you make stuff available. In the first case, probably people aren't too worried about accuracy. In the second case, people will probably really care a lot about understanding the behind the scenes. So you can see how the exact same job, like for example, signing in, might have to be presented in a completely different way. Obstacles in the line of progress are indications which can tell you what artifacts you need to build and how you build them. So is the problem that uh, they first need to understand a certain concept before they can do their job? Or is it the problem that uh, the levers that they need to use are not discoverable? Or is it the problem that uh, they use a certain language and uh, the information to use that thing is not available in that language? Those are all things uh, that you can discover as part of this process. Then, how do we work around this stuff? Like, in the end, uh, these people have been doing this job somehow, so how do they do it? Like, do they pay someone for doing it on their behalf? Do they uh, give up? Do they go to a competitor and uh, never come back? What are the ways in which uh, they work uh, around the current issues? And then finally, what are the trade-offs that they are willing to make? Like how, mu how much money are you gonna make if you solve this job for them? Things like this. So let's make this a bit more concrete. Here I'll uh, pull a couple of examples from uh, the of zero experience. So, for example, the first time that we um, exposed our dashboard, what happened is that uh, we identified every artifact that developer can create as a client. Mostly because, like, we verbatim implemented the specifications. And for the new specifications, unfortunately, everything is a client. And then we had uh, developers use the product, and uh, they would be uh, typically pretty confused about this, as in, like, uh, they would occasionally hear that they need to go in the client settings, and uh, they did even think that it wasn't something that they needed to worry about in their application. They simply didn't connect the fact that when we were saying client, we were talking about their application. So, can anyone guess what we did? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Yes, sir. Almost. If I'd ever prize, it would be yours. But uh, I don't have yet a budget. I just joined. So <laughs> I'll have to pay for a beer tonight if you catch me at the bar. We almost did that. We actually renamed this as an application. Simply as that. We just dropped the client part. And this looks like an easy fix. And it's 
frankly, not the most complicated thing, but imagine that here we have uh, the dashboard, we have a uh, documentation, we have uh, other parts of the dashboard that go deeper, and uh, we have uh, both quantitative and qualitative measures which show that these uh, created a significant difference in how quickly customers find stuff. So, small but powerful. Second case, we uh, call M2M applications uh, what uh, elsewhere you might uh, hear defined as demons or uh, long running up, but long story short, those are confidential clients that run on a backend. So this could be a CLI, this could be anything that runs as the identity of the application. At first, once we added this feature, we just added it as a type of application, and the developer would just go create this app and get the app in there. And then it turns out that we had a disproportionate number of applications which were somewhat dead. Like they were there and people... Sorry, they were taking a picture, so I had to. <laughs> All right. Why do you guys distract me this way? Um, and uh, it turns out that we had a big number of uh, applications which no one left. They created it and then uh, they didn't really do anything with it. And so, of course, we did uh, some uh, uh, analysis and uh, it turns out that uh, the vast majority of cases when someone creates this kind of application, they are doing so because they want to call an API. Like it's just like part of one solution. So what we did here we simply changed the sequence so that uh, when someone is trying to do this job of calling an API from uh, a backend application, we force them to pick an API upfront so that uh, once they come out of a creation experience, they will be already in a position of uh, invoking this API because we do everything upfront. Now, n interestingly enough, once this dialogue came up and uh, I've seen it for the first time, I pushed back and I said, guys, I think that uh, we cannot assume that people will start by the API, and once they create the client, they will already have the API. So now, by forcing them to do this, we'll confuse them. And the guy substantially told me, well, you know, it's your opinion, so we're going to measure it. We're going to ship it anyway and measure it. And uh, I just had to accept it. It's an excellent point. Like, uh, the curse of knowledge works exactly this way. Like, I might think I know, but in fact, uh, I don't, and we need to measure. By the way, after this uh, criticism, we added this uh, cancel and create a new API first, which also solved uh, my issue, so my ego is intact. Not that uh, <laughs> they would have managed to do anything to it because it's very large, but uh, uh, everything worked out. The, the main point is uh, we found the job, we we, we thought we had a solution, and now we are testing it. We don't know yet if it's a solution, which uh, leads me to another point. Normally, you do testing when uh, you have solutions, but when you are searching for a problem, you are still searching for a problem. Like, you might have hypotheses, as in, like, maybe this is the problem, but uh, testing comes once you get to the solution. Before that, you are still in a digging mode. You are still searching for it. And then finally, there is my favorite example, our quick starts. Quick starts are like one of the uh, staples of every developer platform, right? It's uh, something which uh, hit the nice uh, middle ground between uh, giving detailed instructions and getting people up and running. And uh, we did uh, extensive studies on this, and uh, uh, we wanted to understand why developers hire our quick starts, what are the jobs that we're trying to do. And it turns out that there are two main jobs that uh, our developers wanted to do with this. One was uh, getting something up and running as soon as possible. This could be like uh, the case in which they needed to do a demo to their bosses, and somehow they need uh, identity right away. Or they simply are, uh, uh, I to say, the way they use for learning is to actually see stuff around, maybe they wanted to set a network tracer and see actually the traffic. And the other is that uh, some people don't trust the documentation all that much. They just like to operate with the code. But for things that are configuration intensive, like identity services, then uh, it's just a difficult thing to do. It was job one. We didn't do a great uh, job for this. 
let's say that uh, in uh, our existing uh, um, quick starts, we had a button saying download the complete sample, don't follow the steps. Here there is the entire sample. And we even went as far as uh, if you were logged in to automatically configure this thing for you. Like we would inject the values for your own, for your own tenant and we'd uh, allow you to pick which client you want to use. And uh, so you'd come out of this uh, basically ready to run. But uh, a lot of people missed it because long page, there's uh, like this little button on top, and uh, sometimes people would download without being signed in. So that then they would have a large amount of steps to do this. So job one, we supported it, but we could do better. The second job that people typically hired our quick starts for was uh, to learn how to integrate this capability in their existing application. So these people wanted to have the steps for doing this more. They wanted to understand the logical steps that they had to do, so that beyond the recipe, beyond the instructions, they'd understand where they are in the process, so that if they have to delve here and there and adapt it to their case, they'd have a level of understanding which goes beyond what we were saying earlier. And in this case, we were also not doing a great job, because like, uh, we had like, this flat list with uh, all the instructions, but uh, we didn't make a big effort to give a are here map, and uh, we didn't do a great job in defining at high level what these steps were. Well, in the new world, actually, this one I can show you directly on my um, desktop if I manage to use the Mac, which uh, I'm still learning. Is it like, how many of you guys moved from Windows to Mac? Does it still hurt, or uh, now, you are, now it's fine? For me, I'm still in the hurting phase. You know. Then I'll go to uh, acceptance. I bargained uh, a couple of months ago. Now I'm no longer. Uh... Oh, the opposite way. OK, excellent. Well, now I no longer know if I need to be happy for one case or the other. I no longer care, apparently. But it will take some time to kick in. So let me go to our new quick starts, which came online just hours ago, just in time for the conference. And here you land on the, uh, on the homepage, which didn't change yet. And in here, you have like multiple platforms that you can pick exactly like before. But now, when I click my style, here I want to do a single page application and say that I want to do it in Angular. Now I have this header in which I acknowledge these two jobs that I mentioned. They are now explicit. So I'm giving you a, two entry points so that you can choose and not be uh, influenced by one or the other. Like, uh, you don't have to suffer for the existence of the other job. Like, uh, we address both at the same time. And on one side, you have uh, the classic instructions, the steps. Uh, we even tell you how long it's going to take. And uh, we just uh, broke things down in a way which is uh, more logical. Also, we estimate the time, which we didn't before. But the thing that is my favorite is like this other side. In this other side, when you have uh, the download, now we, um, we have this little banner, which I hope will eventually show up. Yeah, it did, but I'm zoomed. So let me do this again. Remember that earlier I said that people were not uh, finding the button. They were not noticing the button. Now we have uh, this little banner, which is always there. So if you scroll out and you no longer see it, it's there, and it tells you, if you want to download the sample, it's here. Not only that, it, now it says, well, now it says just download sample because I'm signed in. But if I would not be signed in, it would tell you, log in and download the sample. And when you click on it, it actually logs you in first. And then we added various other little details, like, for example, when you download the samples, we actually give you specific local instructions for, um, for how to run this thing, because like, uh, in the scenario in which someone is setting up the demo, they might also use a technology they are not super familiar with. So these instructions can make the difference between getting up and running or searching on Google for a long time to find out why Node is not running. And the other thing is that uh, we have inlined the generation of a client if you don't have it. So we really go out of our way to support this specific job, which we don't do when you go on the other side. Because on the other side, 
you know what is your scenario, and so we cannot give you detailed instructions. In fact, they might uh, um, distract you. All right. Back on the saddle. Yep. So those were three examples of uh, how to apply job theory in this context. And if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend reading uh, Competing Against Luck. It's a really good book, and it describes uh, the um, jobs to be done theory in details. And then uh, it's going to be a rabbit hole. If you get hooked on it, you'll find an uh, enormous amount of resources because uh, this thing works. It re it's, it's not just for like, the software industry. It works across the board. Then if you want to learn more about of zero, we have one of the shortest URLs in the industry. It's very easy to remember, so that's a good job that we do. And then if you want to know more about me, you probably don't, so I won't uh, give any details. So here, in summary, remember that you are cursed, that you know too much, that uh, uh, inhabiting the customer is difficult, and uh, you cannot unlearn what you already know. So research, Measure, listen, repeat. Thank you. <laughs> and now we have uh, 13 minutes of questions, but it's unnecessary because I'm sure that you just want to have coffee. <laughs> hint, hint. No, more seriously. Any questions? Yes, sir. Of a dog, actually. Okay. Now I'm more corporate friendly. <laughs> Down to the API. Now, to right. So to be honest, no, not uh, not yet. Let's say that uh, the, this thing is a very top uh, down. And uh, although uh, you might have like, uh, some of the designers uh, uh, aware of this, and so some of the thinking goes in there, and the experimentation, of course, is an uh, important aspect. But so far, well, also I'm new, but as far as I know, we didn't do it yet uh, at the API level. Like this is starting from the top, and it's coming down. Anyone else? All right. So we are free.